Thanks everyone for joining today to this uh, audience-led panel. So the idea of this audience-led is like I just speak and we are quiet. So uh, actually, I mean, because we are mainly interested in your feedback and your uh, knowledge discussion, like uh, your, your uh, feedback about this. So the title of this is a model training for Mother Fortran. Actually, the idea of this was uh, because uh, once a month, that is a UK carpentries uh, meeting, and uh, normally we discuss uh, topics about uh, the carpentries, training, etc. And they were like, uh, we were discussing uh, about uh, some training on uh, Fortran. And the questions that we have, we have is, uh, okay, uh, there are some courses already, for instance, uh, well, I will. Uh, I think I didn't introduce myself. I'm uh, Juan Herrera. I work at uh, EPCC, uh, Edinburgh Parallel Computer Center, the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm uh, responsible of the Archer 2 uh, training uh, service. The Archer 2 is the UK national supercomputing uh, uh, service in the yeah the, the UK. I said that already. Um, so, uh, for instance, there are some courses already uh, prepared of uh, Fortran, but uh, Fortran, as uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, topics. Well, first of all, there are a lot of uh, versions. We have a uh, Fortran 77, Fortran 19, Fortran 2003, um, much more. And uh, okay, which uh, level of uh, we want to teach, uh, like uh, from people that come uh, that maybe they know C, C++, or we, or from, for instance, from Python or we want to start from scratch. I mean, there are many, when we want to uh, develop a course or to design a course, there are many questions that uh, we don't know how to, or what is, uh, le let's say, the um, the most interesting ones uh, for uh, RSCs. So I think that, that was the idea of uh, organizing this uh, audience-led uh, panel. I don't want to keep talking about that because, I'm, as I said, I'm more interested in your feedback or your uh, like the questions that they uh, may have arise. What I will do is uh, before uh, giving you the the floor, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the, the rest of the uh, the panel uh, members. So, uh, well, first uh, here is uh, Dimitrios. Uh, yes. I don't know if you want to, uh, well, Dimitrios from the Met Office. Uh, I don't know if you want to. Uh, yeah, very quickly. So, um, morning, everybody. I'm Dimitrios. I work as a software engineer at the UK Met Office and uh, we are very interested in revamping our Fortran training with more focus on components that are relevant for the new unified uh, earth system modeling framework that is coming live in a few years time. Hi, I'm Colin. I'm a senior research software engineer at the National Oceanography Centre. And my motivation for this is sort of twofold. One is about how we train some of our scientists to do Fortran and to do, is that working? Or to do yeah, Fortran better. Um, because there's a bit of a skills gap there in, in both knowing Fortran at all and using it properly. And also from our research software engineer side of having um, research software engineers who know how to deal with Fortran and can be trained up to cope with those Fortran legacy codes that we've got sitting around that are still being heavily utilized. Um, hello everyone, I'm João Murad. Uh, like Colin, I work at the National Oceanography Center as a research software engineer. And um, well, my main motivation for this was um, to understand how we can uh, uh, help the researchers at NOC um, how to learn uh, modern practices of Fortran because uh, much of the simulation uh, codes that they use to model ocean are still written using uh, old versions of Fortran and uh, it would be interesting to understand uh, what are the necessary um, steps to kind of uh, teach them modern practices and what would be the best way to do that. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ed Hone. I'm a senior RSC at the University of Exeter. Um, and similarly, coming from the RSC kind of standpoint, my motivation is essentially to kind of encourage researchers to continue to use modern Fortran as a as a, a code, uh, a programming language that uh, they can still use in the 21st century, essentially, because there's a lot of great features of Fortran that, um, and it has a bit of a bad reputation. And part of that, I think, is because there is no kind of equivalent 
uh, modern uh, training material that would allow you know uh, researchers or anyone to sort of get started using Fortran. Cool. So yeah, thanks uh, for the works better if I stand up here. Uh, thanks uh, for the introductions and uh, what. Uh, not sure if uh, why I will. Uh, we have like a uh, here some uh, like uh, some uh, um, questions that uh, how long do you expect the uh, intro course to be? Uh, what should the intro course cover? Code style? Uh, 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 what uh, can we do to make it easy to deliver the training? How should we teach uh, documenting code? Uh, how do we use uh, for testing Fortran code? Uh, dealing with legacy code? Uh, Etc. There are like uh, some uh, questions, but uh, what I what I will do is now is I will uh, put the slide or slide. I think yes, yeah, slide is the and uh, also that we have a again audience led panel. We have a microphone here, so if uh, you want to say, well, you can use the slide for yeah questions, comments, but also you can speak. Uh, I will test if. That works, yeah. Oh, oh, it works. So, yeah, Harry. Thank you. So, I can see an issue here, right? So, so this question of what should the course cover, and then the last point was legacy code. So, so if you look at someone who's an RSE, are they are they dealing with new applications? So, at the Met Office, this may be the case. It may be some horrendous old code with memory managed by Cray pointers that you really don't want to go anywhere near. So, so this is a real tricky one. In an introductory course, you can't cover everything, and naturally, what people do is they they rein back on the language standard that they cover. So, they might still be doing even Fortran ninety five. So, that's the question I'm interested in: is who's being targeted here, and how do you design a course that covers the right the content for the people who want to attend it based on what their role is. And that, I think, is a tricky question to answer. Can we jump in? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think part of the, um, there's a, a skills gap was mentioned earlier. Uh, this is something that I have experienced as an RSE as well, because I, I was sort of, um, at some point, sort of, a, a big Fortran code base was slapped on my desk um, figuratively and sort of said, okay, you know Fortran, you know, sort this out essentially, um, because none of the researchers had any experience in using it. And I think essentially with, a, you know, a somewhat practiced eye, I was able to determine that it was essentially not fit for purpose and should be burned. Um, but no, no one in that group was able to make that decision because they sort of assumed that all of the horrendous issues that they had were just a part of Fortran because often not having any familiarity with the language, it can look completely, you know, opaque and unintelligible. Right. So even just allowing researchers to upskill in the language could allow them to make that decision themselves rather than to sort of take someone else's word for it, that this code base is not worth you know, the, um, <laughs> what is, you know, the memory that it has in the, on disk. So I, I actually put that up the, the question sort of about the legacy code and, and you're right, there is still some at the Met office. Um, most of it has been updated. Um, and there was a, a question as to whether that might be an optional module that RSEs were interested in having. What's the best way to go about updating legacy code? So it was sort of um, open for discussion. Cool. So uh, not sure if uh, maybe there is a question in uh, Slido that, uh, yeah, maybe we can answer that one. And if there are other questions or comments, uh, please, uh, uh, raise your hand or use uh, slide for. So the next one is uh, what we do, do we use uh, for testing Fortran code? So if uh, yeah, any of you or any of the panel wants to uh, answer that uh, question. I mean, uh, my experience of testing Fortran code is just purely with essentially PF unit and sort of self-made testing frameworks. Um, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has a similar experience, uh, in using sort of ready-made frameworks, but there's some out there, right? I, I think PF unit is not the only game in town. Mm. Um, 
but uh, yeah the, the other thing as well is that um places like the met office that like develop a lot of fortran code as part of their kind of main um sort of jobs there's a lot of uh onus gets put on organizations like that to develop the modern frameworks that you might use such as a testing framework right that's i mean i don't know if that's still like something that's being talked about in the middle office to develop a custom testing framework so like yeah, so, so we were very interested to hear either through slide uh through slider if possible, like what what do you use for testing, if anything, really? Mm. Um and how how would we perhaps teach that? Would you want that taught? Because the Fortran testing frameworks, they're perhaps not as uh, well, they aren't as extensive as things like if um PyTest, let's take that as an example. The, Python testing framework. And we use PF unit, as Ed mentioned, at the Met Office for some of our Fortran. And uh, it works really well for like the small unit tests and it's in active development. But we are keen to know what other people use um, for their Fortran in their training. Um, and we obviously only we only use it for a small amount of code. It doesn't deal with all our uh, integration testing, system testing, etc. So we're really keen to hear your ideas on on Slido about that. Cool. Uh, thanks. Uh, what uh, Juan here? Uh, that is a suggestion. Like uh, before, uh, any of us uh, speak, like intro well, introduce, like say or name uh, for the uh, for the online uh, people to uh, yeah to uh, distinguish uh, who who is uh, talking so Juan here uh, also uh, yeah this is an interesting question regarding uh, testing uh, but uh, what to is used but it's not for Fortran but I mean could be for any programming language I know that for the Met Office that is uh, one of the codes they use a bespoke uh, Python script that runs a set of uh, tests and check if the accuracy of the results are let's say as uh, expected and it's uh, getting a lot of uh, like uh, interest momentum uh, uh, reframe that is also based in python and you can set uh, like a set of uh, but this is more for uh, well it could be used for hpc but uh I mean you you set up the the, the machine uh, characteristics the compilers etc and uh, you can run a set of tests and check if uh, everything uh, is okay or not there are like a difference though so also i would recommend uh, uh, refrain is like a nice uh, actually we use uh, for Archer 2 and Cirrus to test that uh, everything works uh, as expected. I see a raised hand so uh, I will uh... yeah I'm a computer scientist so Fortran is like you what um, so um, so just that whole discussion of the there isn't a test library and what do you do for testing because it just seems that it kind of breaks everything that we teach everyone about how they should do sustainable development so what is that argument and, and what do we do to get around that if we're going to teach people to do it then how do we make sure they're doing it the way we want them to do it in the way we teach them to do everything else when you're saying we don't have the toolbox in Fortran to do it I mean and then why are we doing it if it breaks everything we teach everything else So I, I guess I can, Demetrius, sorry, Demetrius speaking. Um, PF unit, which I mentioned earlier, is great for unit testing. So we can do that quite well. It works well for our systems at the Met Office. Um, but then we do have perhaps a more bespoke a sort of integration and then system testing framework that we have had to develop ourselves. Um, because PF unit is obviously targeted towards that that sort of unit test level. So it'd be interesting if people have other things that they use, if you could shove it on Slido, that would be amazing because we're very open to knowing what perhaps other people use. But you're right, yes, it's, there's a lack of perhaps tools for all the levels of testing that you might find in other languages so yeah that's no, it's a it's a really really great question sorry this is ed speaking um and it it's i think that part of the um the the question we're trying to sort of solve here is not 
to sort of pose Fortran as something other than um, a modern programming language that you mentioned, all of these uh, specific best practices, which are there for a reason, you know, things like continuous integration and, and deployment and things like that. There is no reason why you can't adopt a similar system with Fortran as your kind of um, language of choice. But it doesn't sort of naturally just come out of the box that way. And I think that, um, in, you know that that's some that's a question potentially that can can something be implemented so that it does or um and is that a barrier to sort of doing some some sort of training material where we say okay for example if we're talking about unit testing then uh is it sort of you know okay that that initial session that you uh, was mentioned earlier by the um by the the code refinery uh, folks saying about we get people to come to that session and, and then get them to compile pf unit from source um, it might be a little bit more kind of difficult, but I think that there are potentially systems available. I mean, like SPAC, for example, which or there are, I think I'm pretty sure there are other tools available as well that allow you to build these kind of dependencies easier. Easy build. Easy build, for example, yeah. Um, so essentially then the question becomes, which of those frameworks are we going to lean on or the, the should should be lent on for um purposes of creating the training material and i'm not sure again i'm I'm not as familiar with easy build maybe maybe colin you can jump in on that but in particular spac is i don't think it's quite stable enough to maybe be leaned on for, for training material that hopefully will last you know maybe not decades into the future but for years to come right so, Colin, here, my worry with Easy Build is it could be quite time consuming. So, trying to do that in a workshop could take a significant chunk of your workshop just getting the Fortran compiler compiled, let alone the code you want to test. Yeah. <laughs> because it not only will go off and compile the compiler, but all the binary utilities and everything else that make the compiler work. <laughs> and in my experience, that can take a few hours sometimes. So, perhaps what we need to actually do is give people a Pre-built environment that's for yeah. um yeah, container would be ideal for their um, workshops with some of this in. And my worry is that that could end up being a bit um, organization specific. And so maybe we need to come out with some kind of common standards that do work, for, you know, as a lowest common denominator, at least for everyone that could be part of training materials. Cool. Yeah. So this is uh, that is an interesting uh, topic about uh, testing. Uh, yeah, something that uh, we should uh, consider when uh, uh, creating a, a course. Uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, I see that, that there is an interesting question on, on top of the well, Juan is speaking. <laughs> uh, uh, interesting question on top of the of the screen that said, uh, "How do we uh, coherently uh, teach uh, modern Fortran when we have uh, many compilers, compiler versions?" which implement different subsets of uh, Fortran 2008, 18, 23, including their own uh, specific uh, buggy implementations. Uh, my experience on that is, uh, yeah, uh, for instance, uh, for Archer 2, we have, a, uh, I work with uh, one of the codes that uh, actually we use uh, two different compilers and the behavior was uh, completely different. Uh, when we run this, uh, the, the the set of uh, test cases, uh, some cases work for one compiler and not the other. Also, the the other way are, are around. So yeah, it's a bit of a nightmare, like dealing with uh, different uh, compilers. I know that uh, now it's like uh, the compilers are getting more about uh, like uh, using, let's say, a standard Fortran rather than uh, uh, understanding going their own uh, like a uh, version of uh, Fortran, but uh, yeah, still like a uh, thing a long uh, way to uh, go. Not sure if uh, anyone from the panel has yeah, so, any moments. So um, Dimitrios. Dimitrios speaking. So I, I sort of smiled at this one because it came up when I was learning Fortran. Um, but the, the Met Office, when we're developing any of our Fortran code, we come compile with, I don't know, I'll just pick G Fortran. And then as we're testing, we will also then compile with, let's say, iFort. And then when we test at the system level, that will be compiled with our Cray compilers on the supercomputers. So we are actively encouraged when we're learning to swap between the compilers that are available. 
And we were given in our training, which I think was really good, and we hopefully would take this forward into anything that we produce, which is this is specific to this compiler. It might be a, a buggy uh, implementation, like you said there, or, or it might be it's implemented slightly differently. You should know this perhaps for the future. I agree. It can introduce difficulty, but I think that for us is is good practice to have maybe one or two compilers that then you can compare with and all of our um all of our examples that we have at the office are compiled with multiple compilers to check that they all produce the same output so if somebody is using i don't know ifort or compared to nag then they're going to get output that is the same you know what one exercise is guaranteed to work across all compilers so i think it's something we have to think about definitely um but i feel like we could we can manage that quite well i don't know if anybody else wants to jump in um as well speaking so yeah i completely agree with that uh, although there are many compilers available i think the majority of people just compile them using uh, either the GNU comp compilers or the Intel ones. So I don't think that is a great problem in terms of the diversity because people tend to stick for most of the applications with these two. Um, but uh, I also believe that is important. The, the point of this question is that it is important to give emphasis to uh, both, basically. And especially uh, because when deploying to certain uh, clusters or to certain systems sometimes you you want to deploy the same code to, to different systems which have different compilers available on them so i think uh, the best uh, approach for this one is to actually focus on the two most important ones that the majority of people use colin here um i was sort of play devil's advocate slightly on that and that my worry if I'm developing training materials is that I want them to be portable and that generally means using open source software stacks which might mean we don't have access to an Intel compiler or it might be a different version to someone else's Intel compiler because they haven't paid for the latest license and especially I imagine with Cray compilers that happens and I kind of want to target the lowest common denominator if I'm producing some training materials and that would definitely be the GNU compiler but saying that this is an issue we can't ignore so I'm thinking, how would I write this in training material? And I think what I would do perhaps is put the examples around the GNU compiler and then maybe some optional exercises mentioning other compilers or at least mention the issues or showing code examples that I know work with other compilers, even if my learners can't access those during a workshop. But if we said earlier about we're going to make a container, can we put Intel compilers in that container and distribute them? I haven't read the Intel license terms in detail enough to know that, but my first instinct would be possibly not. And I can see that might give us some practical issues. Yeah, so, so you can redistribute it. A lot of them let you download it from Intel, but they won't let you redistribute it. For, or, well, potentially if you just have a container um, recipe, yes. then that, that should work. Um, but there are actually more open, uh, openly available Fortran compilers now than there were at least a few years ago. So that does kind of add credence to it. It's a great question. Um, but, uh, but I think like, uh, like Colin mentioned, you just have to go for a basic or a, um, entry level training course. Hopefully those kind of buggy implementations are, well, they should be less frequent because that sort of stuff starts to get a little bit more prevalent in the more advanced stuff that you might cover. Um, having said that, you know, if you're doing a Fortran training course, maybe that's the sort of stuff that you want to get to because it's all about performance. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a good uh, topic to uh, bear in mind and address in a course, but also uh, another difficulty that I see, for instance, is uh, when the, well, Juan speaking, uh, when the core, uh, because uh, for instance, if it's an introductory course, uh, the behavior will be, I would say, the same for all compilers. If you uh, don't know, you do a basic operation, I don't think that would be that much uh, change of the behavior. But uh, for more complex uh, cases, uh, yeah, that could be uh, yeah something to bear in mind. But uh, yeah, thanks uh, for the yeah that that was uh, 
So uh, move on. Uh, that is a, a interesting one. That is a, how is a packaging dependency management and distribution done these days in Fortran? Should we should that be part of the course? I think. Well, also uh, regarding compilers or regarding dependency management libraries, etc. I think it's a bit. I would say specific to the machine that where you run the. Uh, the code. Uh, I mean, you, you use your, your laptop. They say that you are the the. You can decide what you want to store, or not, or if you use a machine like uh, Archer Two Cirrus or uh, one of the machines uh, of uh, the Met, the Met Office. Uh, they have a different uh, set of uh, compilers, uh, different because I think you know, well, could be Intel, could be uh, uh, AMD or uh, HP Cray. Uh, but and also for dependencies as well. So I see that I that yeah, it's a bit uh, machine specific. Uh, but yeah, I think that also that would be good to address that. Uh, not sure if uh, any one of you have uh, any comment or anyone from the panel. Uh... I definitely do. Yeah. So, Ed, so yeah, Ed here. So I, I think it's essential um, that if we're talking about modern programming. Uh, and and that that word modern is being kind of used quite a lot in this in the context of this particular topic, but that is a huge part of most software engineering workflows in this day and age, right? It's there's um, dependency management via infrastructure as code, uh, and that is core to the kind of continuous um, development of code and distribution and all of that sort of stuff. It, it may not be the sort of silver bullet for portability that it might be in other languages, um, which again, I argue that I would argue that it isn't anyway, but um, it's, there is really not, not a kind of one size fits all solution for that with Fortran. Um, although there are tools that are quite promising, such as SPAC, for example, um, which has kind of environment uh, management via infrastructure as code as part of that and the build system sort of baked in. But again, I would argue it's still quite unstable and in active development. So how much could you lean on that for a training course? Um, it, cause it might just disappear <laughs> at any point. So, um, yeah, but I, I think that it's a really, really key point. I'm glad someone brought it up because I think it's really essential. Just kind of Colin here. I think if I was running a course on Fortran like this, I might be tempted to teach sort of old school package management of compile everything yourself. <laughs> but I, I've used Linux long enough to remember the days where I had to compile a lot of dependencies by hand. And although that's far less common these days, it is a useful skill. And when you start to get into the, the world of unusual Fortran codes, that probably becomes more relevant. And it's probably not a skill as many people have now as they did 20 years ago. And that maybe even 10 minutes spent understanding how to do dot slash configure, make, and resolve some dependencies yourself might actually be quite a useful exercise to undertake. Yeah, really good point, actually. It's, it's more experience that you're giving people, um, even if it's not the final kind of solution. And confidence, perhaps, to, to know you can resolve it that way and yeah. show them how to do it. Yeah, that, I don't know if there are any Comments from the yeah, see that there's a comment from the audience. Before we move on, yeah, just a comment for those interested in this. So, so there is a community in the US called Fortran Line, and one of the things they've been <clears throat> one of the things they've been looking at is package management as well as providing standard libraries for things. So if whoever asked that question, it'd be worth looking into that. Thanks, uh, Harvey. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, I, I agree that. Uh, so I think it's uh, interesting that, uh, and sometimes, uh, yeah, I check that uh, website is a good uh, resource. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes. Uh, so as a follow up to the previous comment, I mean, whenever I look at Fortran, Fortran Lang and, a, and the Fortran package management, it doesn't seem very mature to me. I, like to hear other people's opinions. Yeah, I think I think we kind of agree. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's um, 
it's a you know this is an old an old school the old school programming language and this is quite a kind of new development um you know in the grand scheme of things in software engineering so um you can sort of see why that might be a clash of worlds but um and, and again i you know I, I kind of wasn't aware that um fortran lang was tackling that as well as trying to sort of develop their own sort of llvm compile llvm compiler but uh yeah it's i the problem is that you can't really just wait for it to sort of get to a point where it becomes mature because again that's not it, it, looking at the history of fortran that probably never really you know where, where's the cutoff <laughs> where, where you can sort of start teaching it um it might i think any sort of training effort probably needs to look at that as a key aspect that needs to some essentially uh, a solution needs to be decided upon um and used for training uh, in terms of package management um Jean speaking uh, so i think we sometimes forget that uh the typical package managers that are used for other languages can also be used to distribute libraries that uh, can be used in uh, fortran and uh, so for um for a beginner uh, Fortran course, uh, I would definitely try to resort as much as possible to the libraries that are already pre-compiled uh, and available on online repositories through those package managers. Because if, if we are trying to teach people uh, who have never or don't, don't have met much experience compiling libraries to do that before a, a Fortran course, I think we'll end up spending <laughs> the whole day trying just to get the necessary dependencies before like actually diving into the to the code itself okay yeah, i'll quick comment that uh, yeah i see that uh, this the conversation is leading to the like the to the question that is uh, highlighting a slide or that is about the fortran uh, documentation that we see that uh, for uh, uh, for python if we check in stack overflow uh, find the answer, but uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult to find uh, like a good uh, uh, resource uh, for, for that. And th that brings to my mind that in a lot of current these courses, uh, there is a section of uh, documentation. If you want to learn more, check this book, check these uh, resources. So for instance, yeah, the, the resource that I had been mentioned before, the Fortran, Fortran Land. Yeah, for, Fortran, Fortran Land is that? Yeah. yeah. That is a good, uh, but I uh, don't know if you, yeah, if there are any, any resources that uh, you want to uh, advise on, yeah, uh, Dimitrios is. So, yeah, so, sorry, Dimitrios speaking. Um, so there, there was a question up there also about things like make and debugging, and I think that comes into online documentation, and Fortran Lang is a great resource, but I think for me, uh, so some context, I... Uh, studied C++ when I was at university, that was many years ago. So when I joined the Met Office and all of a sudden had to learn Fortran, which I thought was dead at the time, um, but apparently, no, it is still used. And for good reason, for good reason, but all of a sudden I had to learn this language and there aren't as many resources online as, let's say, Python or C++. So part of what we are doing at the Met Office is like, right, what do we need in our training? We need to perhaps look at how make is used, how we teach um, the compiling. Somebody mentioned the debugging. Where is our documentation and where does this training going to end up? Which is why um, it's great that we're doing this and hopefully we will create together um, some newer training dealing with all the concerns and questions we all have. I will just bring it right back around in a circle very briefly and say, I know we were talking about package managing and compilers and everything, but when I, I must admit, when I was joining the Met Office, um, I, I hadn't got access to my office computer yet. So I did just download, don't bite me on Windows, a compiler for Fortran. And that was very simple just to get started with the basics. So I think it to get the basics and for an intro course, I think the key is to keep it very simple, but embed best practices where we can. But yeah, so sorry. No, that uh, no, that uh, leaks uh, 
Th uh, thanks. Uh, well, Juan is speaking. Yeah, thanks for the answer. That uh, and also, yeah, li listen to. I have the same experience when I was joining PCC. I actually rather than C plus plus, I only C. So uh, learning Fortran, yeah, was like a challenge. That okay, well, what's that? <laughs> but yeah, I uh, now I feel more. Uh, uh, and also another comment that uh, came to my mind is uh, like uh, there is a book called Introduction to Fortran that I think is uh, eight hundred or nine hundred. Ages, so it's a kind of <laughs> yeah. So I came from that C plus plus thing as well, and you just hit compile and it compiles, and I don't have to think. I didn't. It was old. It was twenty years ago. You just hit compile and it just did it. So what is that? And that was my early question. That I basically that what is that difference? Because someone said, is it any difference to teaching new C plus plus? Well, I don't know. I've not written any new C plus plus, but it sounds kind of really yucky in comparison. So so what is that difference? If you're saying it's quite horrible, because I'm a bit. So, not sure. Demetra was speaking again. Um, I didn't make, mean to make it sound horrible. If I did, I apologise. Um, actually, that that beginning bit for me, trying to do it on my terrible Windows computer at home, was really easy. So I want to just emphasise that that was stress free. I could just download, and then yes, I just linked and compiled. I had to look up for the, um, I think the G Fortran compiler to check what I was doing was correct, but then it was a bit like the C++, the compiled experience that I had before. If perhaps we were to do, uh, maybe not in an introductory course, but an intermediate course and talk more about package management and make system to compile perhaps a slightly larger Fortran program, then yes, it might get a bit more complicated, but I feel like C++ can be the same with CMake. So me personally, I don't really see much of a difference when I'm trying to compile Fortran versus C++. They both give me a headache and... Also answering to that question, I, I, I would not say that like, I don't know one language is uh, better than the other one. Like, which is, uh, I think it's more the, the language that you are more familiar with. The thing is I spent like uh, 10 years at the university learning C, working with C. So changing to Fortran was a little bit of, uh, it's like uh, the same that uh, from Spain uh, when I had to learn, I had to learn English. So I was not, yeah, well, it was like a challenge to learn a different language. And I think that, yeah, that could be, could, could apply. And uh, also I have seen the other way around. I have a, a colleague of mine that sit down ne next to me. Uh, she learned uh, Fortran all the time and uh, she had to do a project in C++ and also was yeah, it was like the same, like uh, was the language and a lot of uh, a lot of features of uh, C, C++ that I was more familiar with them as it was less fun. So I think that's also the, I think it's the language that uh, you learn from the beginning or you are more familiar with that to change the languages. Also, we uh, identify that uh, we had delivered a course on uh, C++ and uh, we found that the people coming from Fortran find that uh, some topics were like more relevant or, re or less relevant. And also we find that the people coming, for instance, from Python, they found, so it also it's uh, quite important, let's say the language that you are more familiar with, if you are, if you come from uh, Fortran, some topics uh, maybe you need to pay more attention than others. Uh, the other way around, if you come from Python, maybe. So this is also a, Another uh, aspect to bear, to bear in mind that uh, let's say the maybe your uh, native language, uh, <laughs> computer science uh, talking. No, sure if anyone has, uh, I, Lewis has a hand. Ah, so, sorry, I'm just I ignoring you. Um, <laughs> I will give you the. Uh, so Lewis Sampson, I'm a RSC from uh, UKRI SDFC. So I, I just had a kind of comment on this, the question at the moment. So the, the last bit they say is, what can we do to improve this situation? So the idea that, uh, like I, I use Python a lot and I previously did a lot of Fortran coding at the Met Office. Um, and like the big difference I've seen is that there is a lot of uh, answers on Stack Overflow. And I think it has to come from the community. It has to be a supported thing from like the experts that do know those questions. So, um, as well as like the training course that you're doing, it'd be good to also make sure you've got a lot of material documentation that you're putting online and that is then open to everyone. And like everyone seems to have sort of more bespoke issues and stuff like that, but the more that it is publicized and documented, it kind of gets shared around a lot. I think that's why Python has that big interface. 
So, um, Demetrius speaking here. Can I just jump in on from what Lewis said to that wonderful phrase, are uh, completely arcane to a beginner, but in that question at the bottom, um, I, I did find that there were a few things that were different to C++ that um, perhaps things like pointers, or in fact, even at the basic level with Fortran, the sort of uh, implicit bits, implicit save and all, all of this other stuff. And, and we're very keen to put in those sort of gotchas that you need to be aware of if you're coming from another language, because it's obviously very Fortran specific and it trips up a lot of beginners. But once you know it and you know the best practice of, let's say, using implicit none, then it's very quickly not a problem anymore. So we are very keen to put that into our training. Oh. Hello, uh, Sarah Jaffa. I'm an RSE from UCL. Um, just thinking about that, the if we are going to try and increase the amount of Fortran things on Stack Overflow, one of the things I have definitely experienced myself as someone self-taught coder trying to learn Python, C++ and Fortran at various points in my life, and I think I even saw someone who did some kind of text mining analysis on this on Stack Overflow, that there is a big difference if you look at the answers that are out there between the language used in Python answers versus in C++ and lower level languages. So if we are going to try and increase the amount of Fortran answers on there, please be very aware that the people you are talking to are beginners and just think about how you phrase things. Because I find a lot of my difficulties learning C++ is that the community is quite aggressive. And if you post something, people tend to go, this is wrong. Why would you ever do this? This is the worst way to code. You should always, and they they go for like, you should always be using these 17 high level, like super fancy packages. You should be doing the most modern standards. Whereas Python people are like, I can see why you did that. It might not be the best. If you really want to do the best, you could do this. But if that's too hard, try doing this. And if we want to get more people learning Fortran easily, we need to do the Python way of like, don't go for best standards, go for okay standards and really think about the language you're using to not be discouraging. That's a really, really, really good point. Thank you for bringing that up, yeah. Um, oh, there's another hand, I think, Alan. Uh, how are we, I don't know if this is working, how are we defining uh, modern Fortran? Uh, like, and what, what functions are we talking about? Because like, at the learning stage, there might be like a vanilla level of Fortran 90 or something like that. Let's like, like where you want to start teaching and then you'll teach like the later stuff later uh, because many people aren't going to use the modern functions anyway. I'm happy to, sorry, this is Ed. Um, I, I think the generally accepted kind of cutoff for modern Fortran is 08. Is that right? And that's essentially when OO functionality sort of made its way in. Um, and I'm actually not sure that that's the case because there's a lot, I mean, there's some bad rep that gets put out there for Fortran's OO implementation, but I find it easy to write beautiful code in. And I think that it's as a language, Fortran um, is simple and it allows you to write code in a way that is exceptionally explicit, which again, in turn, can mean that your code is more maintainable uh, than other languages, for example, such as Rust, which encourages in its sort of pursuit of uh, extreme safety, a lot of kind of extra boilerplate, which can be very intimidating for a new user. Um, whereas Fortran, maybe it's less safe, but it does allow you to write code that's very, very clear. Um, and I think that uh, generally, again, mod um, people picking up programming um, and software engineering are interested in object orientation because it allows them to kind of explore a wider playground and create more rules that then they can use to write the code that they really want to rather than the limitations that were previously imposed on sort of compiled languages like C and Fortran. So I think that it might be even better to just sort of forget that there was a non, sorry, forget about non-modern Fortran, go straight for the OO sort of implementation and in so doing, the the older 
like F77, F90 stuff gets baked in because it's it is essentially backwards compatible. There isn't, you know, we talk about different standards, but it is an evolution rather than a kind of ripping up of the book each time. But I'm, you know, obviously that's just an opinion. Um, yeah. So just one last thing to add to that is Demetrius speaking. Certainly from a Met Office perspective, we use um, object oriented Fortran extensively in our modeling framework. So we would like perhaps an introductory course to it go from the basics up to object oriented Fortran. Actually, yeah, I think I touched something in the microphone and I broke it. <laughs> uh, actually, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, because uh, some languages uh, include uh, this way or the, this uh, paradigm of uh, object orientation. And I think if you don't have like the basic uh, knowledge or let's say the concept or a baseline to understand uh, what that paradigm uh, means, it would be difficult to develop uh, like a good code or develop, a, but yeah, it could be applicable to uh, Fortran or any programming language. But yeah, it's, uh, I think this, this is a really good point that we should wear bear in mind. Okay, so I see that we have uh, five minutes left. So any last uh, questions or topics that uh, you would like to uh, discuss? Uh, hi, so I'm Thomas, I'm RC from UCL. I slightly disagree with the previous statements. I mean, I think we should like be clear about what is the objective of teaching people Fortran. And it seems like the most, most, the experience of most people is, is having to deal with legacy code. And if you get given a Fortran 77 to go 77 code and you go, okay, I'm going to rewrite this in object oriented Fortran. At that point, do you really want to rewrite it in Fortran or should you consider something else. I mean, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Any comments? Actually, yeah, yeah. really interesting <laughs> question uh, to finish it, it's, this. Uh... <laughs> it's a fine, it's a fine point. Um, but I th again, it's, it would be, first of all, Fortran as a language exists and therefore, and you know, the, the hand wavy modern standards of Fortran exist training also needs to be there. Um, I have had that argument a few times. I've heard it. I personally think that uh, if you can write something in object-oriented Fortran, then there's absolutely no reason not to. Um, and again, I find that Fortran as a language is absolutely one of my favorites to write in, um, more so than a lot of uh, other compiled languages. Again, that's probably just personal experience. Um, but the the point there is people should be able to have their own personal choice about what language they use um and for for someone who is familiar with the fortran sort of syntax it may be easier for them to pick up the the concept of object orientation um and sort of run with that in a language that they are familiar with rather than learning something from scratch um but yeah colin sorry Probably two points on that so colin here that the two strengths that Fortran often plays to is one is performance and two is that the translation from the mathematics to the code is quite obvious. And I think that still holds true for the object-oriented Fortran. So those are two reasons you want to push for keeping things in Fortran and not translating them to another language. Okay, last uh, question. Well, to reply to that, <clears throat> the great thing about Fortran is you don't, why would you rewrite it? If, if you've got a library in Fortran 77 that works perfectly fine, don't touch it. Like, um, if you're learning modern Fortran, you, the, the benefit of Fortran is it's just like, like C and C++. People write C code in C++, call it .cpp, it's C. So you can interface with the Fortran 77 code without rewriting it. So you can learn to write new codes, like, I mean, you mentioned this, where you can write in modern Fortran, use it, but no one's going to necessarily rewrite, uh, you know, already existing mathematical libraries that have been tested and tried for years. Like, you're not going to do that. Like, you're not going to rewrite BLAST or LARPAC or whatever. Um, so that's the benefit of, of keeping it in Fortran to answer your question is you don't need to rewrite it. You can learn about it and know it exists but then take the benefit of a modern programming language like modern Fortran, where you can do object oriented stuff. 
Okay, so yeah, just to finish this, uh, there is a question there that is actually is an important one that I don't sh sure about the answer that uh, where should we continue this discussion after today? I'm not sure if I'm creating a Slack. There is a Fortran channel on RSC Slack, I think. Oh, okay. So, okay. That, uh, so yeah, in that, uh, I think I should join that channel. I don't know why. I, I think I, I, I banned that channel from my, no. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay. So I think we are now uh, closing because I guess that are 20 seconds left. If my, so, uh, thanks, uh, everyone, the audience. Oops. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone, panel, audience. Uh, Again, everyone, and uh, yeah, let's keep it the discussion uh, during lunch time or this uh, Fortran channel in the RSC uh, uh, group. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. thanks.